Today, I'm really excited to welcome to the show the lovely and very talented Kate Toon. Kate is an award-winning digital marketing entrepreneur. She's a proud business misfit as well. She's also a Google Beast tamer, um, a copywriting coach, popular educator, speaker, author, and podcaster. You're one very talented lady, Kate. Welcome to the Simply Stand Up Marketing Podcast. It's lovely to be here. I have to say, you have one of the nicest podcast art images I've ever seen. I love it. Ooh, thank you. I'll have to tell <laughs> my very talented graphic designer, Michelle. So I, I said the colours and she did the rest. It's very beautiful. I love it. Oh, thank you. So now look, today, Kate, we're talking all things SEO um, because I want to help um, just like you, small businesses with something that they find totally overwhelming, um, being search engine optimization. But as you and I know, I know from making mistakes myself, that SEO can make such a huge difference to growing their organic website traffic. So I definitely learned by going, no, no, it'll be fine. It'll, you know, I'll catch up. <laughs> years ago so how did you get to work get to um working in seo oh i mean it's not like i was a child thinking when i grow up i, I want to work with seo in fact obviously the internet didn't exist uh when i was a child so um that mm -hmm. old so um i started working in advertising uh straight pretty much straight out of university um and then uh, i was working in events and this amazing new invention came along which was websites so i was Working at one of the first digital agencies in London, I worked on the Marks and Spencer's first ever website, which is a bit of a claim to fame. And mm. it kind of evolved from there. I had various jobs at big advertising agencies like Ogilvy. Um, but then I worked at a particular agency called advertising.com, where they were starting to work in the kind of nascent area of optimization. Because in the early days, you know, there weren't that many websites. And if you wanted to rank, you literally just put some words in your the header of your website and you ranked. Google was very unsophisticated. There were no ads. There was no video and no image tab and all the different things we see now. It was just 10 blue links. Um, and then over the years, I, you know, I did a lot of work in agency and then I went out on my own about 12 years ago. And that's when I started to do SEO um audits and copy for smaller businesses and then from there grew the courses the resources and all the other things so it's been a bit of a an epic journey really it certainly has and you like me have been there from the very start i remember um my first website being uh the rspca and yeah as you say it was so easy i didn't even know what seo meant or probably didn't even <laughs> exist back then <laughs> no, no it's not as a discipline and not as like a a business area that really has only been the last 10 or so years and really massively I've seen a massive increase over the last seven years so when I launched my course which is back back in 2014 there was not a single other SEO course in Australia and I was the only one of the, one of the only there's another lady called Heather uh, Lloyd Smith who's an SEO copywriter but one of the only women who had an SEO education kind of space and now every dog in his badger has an SEO course, but it was very different back then. Yes, and it is something that you need to learn. You, I found, you know, I tried to do it by myself and um, it is so much easier when you learn from people like yourself how to actually do it. Uh, <laughs> but, hey, for those who, you know, are just starting out and really, you know, they've got their website up and things like that, but really are drowning and when they hear the word SEO, what is the basics of what is SEO and, and how do search engines work? So I think SEO is a very, you know, unpalatable term for something that really just means making Google fall in love with your website. So Google, uh, like everybody else, is fussy and it has a big list of things that it wants to see on websites. We think there's about 200 or so factors and some of them are more important than others. 
most of them are common sense. They're things that humans want as well. So, you know, for example, a big factor for Google is how quickly your website loads because no one likes sitting around waiting for a website to load. Uh, another big factor is how good does it look on a, on a mobile device? How easy is it to use? Um, Google cares about things like security and good content and not having hundreds of pop-ups popping everywhere. So really it's about understanding what Google would like to see on your website and then doing that. Um, that it's literally that simple. I guess the complexity comes from when you've done the basics and now you're into the more pointy end where things are less black and white and a bit more subjective. You know, what is good content? What makes a good title tag? That kind of stuff. But it's very rude. It's building a website that Google loves and when Google loves it, people will love it too. And then everyone's happy. So yeah, it, I think SEO literally means search engine optimization, but it's, a, it's just making your website better, I think is an easier way of understanding it. Yes, yes, that, that makes total sense. So what about from the point of view, you talked about some of the things that Google looks for in a website and in a web page. Um, what are some of the things that people could do that webs you know you say um websites loading quickly what should they be aiming for like how many seconds um is the current i know this this does change um and things like mobile opt optimization what are some of the things they could tick off their list now to um to do well i'll give you some some simple tips so things that will make a big difference quickly yeah so as you yes. said speed speed is a great one uh, to choose. Whether or not it's the most impa important factor from Google's point of view is debatable, but it's one of the easiest, can be one of the easiest ones to fix. So ideally you want your site to load in three seconds or less. Uh, mobiles are a little bit fiercer than desktops, so it's like desktops allow your site to be a tad slower. But these days Google is a mobile first search engine, so it doesn't even look at the desktop version of your site, it's only looking at the mobile content. So how can you improve that? Well, you know, easy things are look at your images. Are they huge? Did you upload them at 5,000 pixels by 5,000 pixels? Did you compress them in any way? Do you have too many images? Um, videos, you know, have you optimized those? Are you hosting them on a third party platform like YouTube or video? It's much better if you are. Um, you know, things like if you're on Shopify, looking at the number of apps that you have running. If you're on WordPress, looking at the number of plugins you have running. Do you need them all? Could you get rid of a few? And then things like feeds. So do you have an Instagram feed or a Facebook feed? Anything that's putting content from another site into your site is going to slow it down. And then once you fix all those kind of things, you kind of have to look at the big stuff. Like, where are you hosting your site? There's not much you can do about that if you're on Shopify or Squarespace or Wix or Weebly, but on WordPress, moving to a better hosting company can make a huge difference to your speed. So some of those things are easier for um, a normal human to do, and some of them you might need a developer to help you. But the most important thing is understanding what you need to do. You don't necessarily need to be able to do it yourself, but understanding that yes, it needs to be three seconds, here are some things to fix it. Go get someone to fix those things, then run the tests again. There's a great tool uh, called Pingdom Site Speed. Maybe you can include a link in your notes. Oh, I will. Site. I know that one. Yeah, it's a goodie. <laughs> so you can run your site through that, see how slow it is, then send it off to your developer to fix it up, and then run that test again, and you'll know if your developer has gonna, done a good job or not. So it's all about empowerment. Um, the next thing you asked about was mobile optimization. And again, really a lot of that is common sense. You know, big images don't work well on mobile. Video works okay. You know, you need to make sure your contrast is really good with your text and your background. You don't want to have fiddly little navigations that drop all over the place. Um, you want to make sure your buttons are nice and big so you can get your thumb over them and not touch the wrong thing. The best way really to test for mobile optimization is to try and do stuff on your own website, on your phone. People don't do that. Like when was the last time you filled out your contact form on your phone, on your own website, or ordered a product on your phone, on your own website? You do that with the sun glaring in coals and you'll see very quickly all the mobile optimization issues that your site has. Um, and it's a great test to do, yeah. 
Yeah, I also find um, getting you know, getting someone like my husband or you know someone like that with bigger fingers to yes <laughs> to actually do it and, and see because I find we know our sites so well and you yeah. know how they work and how they're supposed to work but if you give it to someone else who has no idea um, that is always such a good test. Um, so that's sort of a double test, I suppose. Exactly. And also they're on a different device probably. So maybe you've got an iPhone, phone, they've got a Samsung. Most of us work on our sites on a desktop, so we never really see the mobile experience. And as you said, we think we know our sites really well, but sometimes someone else looking at them, they spot something and we're like, oh, my God. Like, I think I had a typo. I had a typo on Kate Toon Copywriter for four years on the homepage, and I just never saw it, you know? So how many business clients I lost because of that, I don't know. But it's very hard to spot your own mistakes, I think. Oh, it is, absolutely. And I do copywriting as well, and you will find that, you know, there'll be something and you would have read it over and over again. And, um, yeah, it's one of those hand it over to someone else and go, oh, can you just read that? for me because it, it could say anything right about now <laughs> <laughs> exactly so um and I even find that from a from a um from a copywriting website writing point of view we might understand what we're talking about but does everyone else actually necessarily understand what we're talking about and, and know what we mean and um what we're all about so I, I think that's yeah. a great one um, you know, we talked about a few technical things there, but, you know, readability um, of content is actually a factor you know, from Google's perspective. How easy is it to read and understand your copy? Um, and, you know, most people, when they're trying to sound clever, use longer sentences and bigger words and more complex structure. But actually, it really doesn't help, especially when, you know, a lot of people reading a website might have English as a second language. So there's another wonderful tool that I love called Hemingway app which will look at the readability age of your content and give you tips on how to improve it. Really, you should be aiming for around grade seven readability age, um, not university graduate. Yeah, Even if the person reading your page is a university graduate, the way we read online is dramatically different to the way we read print. So you have to be aware of that when you're writing your web copy. Yes, yes, absolutely. And for those writing... Um, headlines for blogs and things along those lines I use headliner uh, which gives you a similar readability score and um, tells you what's what's really grabbing so I mean there's so many tools and, and we'll get to some of the other tools a bit later but there are so many amazing tools out there that and so many of them are free um, which is great yeah now let's talk about some of the mistakes and, and misconceptions and some of the really dodgy uh, bad things that um, are done with regards to SEO and, and that no doubt people will have received emails about to. Uh... <laughs> so I think, look, I am a, an SEO expert to a degree. I hate the word expert, but you know what I mean. And I get those emails too. Greetings of the day. You know, I've looked at your website. It's full of errors. If you want me to fix them, get in touch. Everybody gets yes. those emails. They have not looked at your website. It is highly likely that it's not full of web uh, errors. So all of those emails should be immediately deleted. Never, ever read them. Never believe a word they say. Uh, because good SEO people don't have to solicit clients in that way. Just as good. You never get those emails from graphic designers or accountants or, you know, anybody else. So I don't know yes. why the SEO industry has done that. It gives us all a very bad name. Um, so the bad things that you can do, there's, a t there's terms in SEO. There's white hat SEO and black hat SEO. So white hat SEO is kind of, I'm a white hat, uh, which means I teach the good stuff. It's like being the white witch in the, in the Wizard of Oz. I teach the good stuff, the stuff that doesn't go against Google's regulations and it's not going to get me uh, a penalty. Black hat SEO is kind of a bit more dodgy. You're doing things that probably could get you a penalty, but hope you hope that Google doesn't notice. Um, the problem is that some of the black hat things work very well for a short period. Yeah. Mm. So often these dodgy SEO companies will say things like, we can get you to number one for this particular phrase. And they use black hat tactics to do that. Um, and then you so you succeed and you give them your money and you're like, wow, this is working. And then your site stops dropping 
And then you can't get hold of your SEO agency and they've disappeared, especially if you're hiring people off Fiverr or Upwork who can just delete their profile and make a new profile tomorrow. So, you know, really, if you're going to work with an SEO person, you need to get recommendations um, uh, from people who are still working with them and from people who understand what SEO is. Because I often see people in Facebook groups saying, oh, you know, Barbara is amazing. She did such a good job with my SEO. But you have a pretty un good understanding that this person doesn't understand what SEO is. So they don't know whether Barbara's done a good job or not. Barbara may be the most wonderful person, but it can be like the blind leading the blind. So getting good recommendations is super important. And I'm not sure I even answered your question there because I think you wanted to know what were some of the dodgy things people do. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but, you, but you, you did really. I mean, in, in some ways, yes, absolutely. So yeah. because there is, people need to understand that there are the, you know, the white hats and the, and the black and some of the terrible things. But, yeah, how do you work out if they are legitimate? You know, what are some of the terrible things that, um, that people are offered? Yeah. Well, um, I've got a, a free little thing, which I'll give you a link to, called my SEO Nibbles course. And at the end, there's a, a questionnaire that you can ask any person who you're going to work with with SEO and then the answers that you want them to give. Um, the truth is that a good SEO person is pretty transparent and they're pretty honest. So they won't claim that they can get you number one ranking. Um, if they do <laughs> offer to improve your site, it will probably only be for a couple of different keywords. It won't be for hundreds and hundreds. Um, they will talk more about different factors, not so much ranking, but traffic and conversion and money. Um, you know, because for example, you could be ranking in position three, but when someone hits your site, you just your conversion optimization isn't very good. And so you're not making the most of that position that you already have. So you have an SEO is usually transparent. They're honest about the results and don't make big promises. They probably will ask you to commit for at least six months because it can take that long to kind of see any difference. And they're very open about their tactics. There are no special magic tactics with SEO. Yeah, <laughs> even I don't have any. I can't tell you. I can't after this call go, hey, Nikki, if you do this, it's going to improve your ranking. Um, because it's a process and everything that Google wants us to do to improve SEO is freely available on the internet. They tell us pretty much everything they yep. want us to do. Um, and then after that, it's about, you know, understanding what the priorities are and putting the time in. So an SEO person that says they have a secret methodology or a special relationship with Google, they're lying. <laughs> yeah. So. It's, it is hard and it is a minefield. And I mean, that's why I created the course, because I think a little bit of education can be a really powerful thing. And it helps you understand when you're being bamboozled, you know, like if you get on a call with an SEO person and they're like, well, your XML isn't linking and your PHP and your JavaScript aren't, you know, I'm integrating with your AI. And what? Like, don't try and use jargon and try and make yes. it seem more complicated than it is it is not a dark art anybody anybody can learn seo just like anybody can learn how to write and how to you know do bookkeeping and whatever it's what you're interested in and i think as a small business owner it's behooven on you i love that word it's behooven on you <laughs> to understand enough about all of those things just a little bit um, so that you, you know, like I would never hire an accountant without even a basic understanding of accountancy, because then how do I know if the accountant's good or bad? You know, yeah. so I'm babbling now. I'm babbling. But no, you know what no, I no, 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 not <laughs> at all. Not at all. So, and look, I find so many, you know, I have clients who come on and you know, someone's tried to say something, you know, tell them about, oh, yeah, SEO, it all needs to, now you have to do Google Ads and this is why I'm, I come in there and they're spending this extraordinary amount of money on on Google Ads, but um, their keywords and things are just non-existent. Like they have no SEO whatsoever and you go, okay, this is all just a monumental waste of money. Yeah. I mean, I've Ads are interesting because Google Ads has nothing to do with SEO, as you, as you know. You, know, yes, you yes. can pay heaps of money for Google Ads and it won't improve your organic ranking. Um, so, And the great thing about ads is you pay your money, you get your click. You know, you pay your $1,000 yes. a month, you're going to get your clicks and you can track it and you can change the keywords and the ads, but you're paying all that money. Um, but the truth is with SEO, you still pay. You know, because you have to pay someone, you have to pay to do a course or you have to pay someone to optimize pages. Um, 
it can be more cost effective because you may pay once and then the value of the SEO lasts for a long time. So I've got work yeah. that I did in 2009 that's still ranking really, really well. So, you know, but you still pay. You might just pay more in time than in money and the results will just not be as immediate, but they will be more long lasting. But yeah, people, yeah. you know, I've had people come on the course who are spending $3,000 a month on an SEO agency with absolutely no idea what they're doing. Not yep. one iota of idea. Um, it's terrifying, really. I know. So this is this is our thing, and this is you know you've spent years trying to educate people as to what they need to be doing, which I just absolutely love. So now look, let's talk about keywords because um, we you chatted a bit about those before. What's a simple way if someone's starting out so they can get a basic understanding? How do they find keywords for their website? Well, I mean, I think people misunderstand what keywords are. Literally, it's just trying to make a connection between what you type into Google and what Google displays. Yeah. And people keep on saying keywords don't matter anymore. Google will work it out. But at the end of the day, if you if people are typing in, you know, purple hedgehog jumper and you want a bit of that traffic, well, you have to use the words purple hedgehog and jumper at some point in your site. Yeah. It, it, Google's yes. not that smart. It's pretty smart. Um, so we mustn't think of keywords. It's really keyword phrases. No one's going to rank for a single word term like shoes. You know, you got to be a competition. Even blue <laughs> shoes still com competitive. Blue running shoes still competitive. Men's blue running shoes still competitive. So we get longer and longer and longer with our keyword phrases, and those are called long tail keywords. And that's really where small businesses can win because while Nike may own running shoes and you will never beat them on that they cannot possibly rank for every iteration around that you know like uh small running shoes for men purple with green laces yes much fewer people are typing that into google but you can rank number one and get all of them you know if you have the right traffic so how do you find keywords i mean it's a pretty simple process which is incredibly complex first of all you brainstorm and you write down every possible keyword you can think of maybe you ask your audience what would you type in to find this that and the other you can use tools one of my favorites is keyword shitter which is a terrible name but it's lots of fun uh, i haven't heard of that one <laughs> there's uber suggest there's lots of free tools that will help you generate like a seed list of potential keywords and then you need to put them into tools again. You can put them into Google and just see what comes up. But you can put them into tools and you, you're basically looking for two things. How much traffic does that keyword have? How many people are searching for it a month? And how competitive is it? So what we want is something with lots of searches and that's not very competitive. And that can be hard. Yeah, so <laughs> That is very hard these hard. days. So, yes, and you'll never... There's no such thing as a perfect keyword or a golden keyword. Literally, you need to go through your site page by page, homepage first, most important page on your site, and go, what would I want someone to type into Google to find this page? You know, And if you already rank for your brand name, then you would move away from trying to rank it for your brand name, and then you would try and rank it for something you do. So say for me, it might be SEO courses. You know, and I'm going to go, choose the keyword SEO course and I'm going to put it into a tool. And it's going to say loads of people are searching for this, but it's super competitive. So then I might add a word at the beginning, free SEO courses. And that might bring the volume down, but it might bring the competition down. Australian SEO courses, female led SEO courses. What I'm trying to do is find a keyword that I can rank for in the top three, because if I'm not in the top three, probably I'm not going to get any click throughs at all. And that may cause me to go longer and longer and longer, but better to go for longer keywords than to try and go for short keywords that I'm, I'm going to be on page 74 or 4. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, it makes sense to me, but I also know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but it does. I mean, there's no point in, in ranking for a keyword if no one's ever going to find you for it. Oh, this is it. And, you know, um, uh, one, I just did a post about this, but you know, you'll see people in Facebook groups going, Oh my God, I'm ranking number one for the most obscure phrase in the world. And it's like, you're ranking number one for it because no one's ever typed that into Google ever. And also you don't realize that you're looking at your site in your own browser. So the results have been personalized to you. Google will always show you your site first. 
uh, and you're not seeing a real picture of where you're ranking because if you go in and type that in and your site pops up first it's not because you're ranking number one it's because yeah. google knows you love your own website and it will always show you at first so yeah um that's why google's so clever <laughs> yes it is far too clever it knows everything about us it's terrifying Oh, it does. It does. That and <laughs> Facebook, definitely. So, <laughs> Now, one thing that people do need to think about is the different search intents um, mm. that people have when they actually go on to the internet. So what are, what are the main ones that, that you always consider? I love that you brought this up because a lot of people don't, aren't aware of this. So search your intent. I love that you brought that up. Google had an <laughs> algorithm update. It was quite a while ago. It was called Hummingbird. And that was all about intent. And it was when Google kind of went up, it up leveled. Yeah. So it stopped yep. just looking at what you're typing and it started to understand why you're typing it. Now, this is where it gets scary. So if I type in piglet jumper, what do I want from Google? Do I want to see pictures of piglet jumpers? Do I want knitting patterns? Do I want jumpers with piglets on them or piglets wearing jumper? jumpers we don't know yeah piglet jumper is confusing um, yeah. if you do type piglet jumper into google you're probably going to get a lot of images and videos because it thinks you want to see pictures it doesn't quite understand your intent but as soon as we add what's called a modifier to that phrase it completely changes the way google acts so if i add the word cute immediately the search engine results will change to being primarily images and video if I add the word how to, Google will dramatically change and start showing me featured answers, uh, knitting patterns, and YouTube videos showing me how to knit piglet jumpers. If I add but the word buy, the search end results will change again and there'll be a shopping carousel, there'll be ads, because each of those has a different searcher intent. And you asked how many there are. There, you, people think there's four, five, possibly five. Yeah. So the four are conversion intent or transaction intent i want to buy something information intent i want to know something investigational intent i want to compare x with y and then navigational intent i just want to get somewhere on the internet i want to get to the netbank login page yeah and then the final one is location intent so if you you know if google thinks you have a local intent like you're looking for pizza pizza hut near me it will change the search engine results to show a map, a local pack, and that kind of thing. So really, there's four, possibly five different intents. And, and they matter so much because, A, as I said, they change the search engine results page. But like if you're a shop, you kind of want to have more conversion intent keywords than maybe informational. You know, informational is blog posts and, you know, that kind of stuff. Great. I mean, they're good, they're educational, but they're probably not going to lead to a sale. You know, so mm. they may in the long term because you're building trust and authority and that's fantastic. But really, you lie in, in, in conversion intent. You want to sell stuff. So you need to be going after phrases like buy, money, affordable, price, online, Australia, free shipping, free delivery, piglet jumper, free delivery, <laughs> buy piglet jumper online, Australia. They have conversion intent. Piglet jumper doesn't have conversion intent. Do you see what I mean? So yes, it's about, yeah. yeah, super important. And people just don't seem to be aware of it at all. So I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah. Now, what people tend to think that, okay, well, it's just about the, you know, I'm a, uh, a dietitian or I sell pool equipment or whatever it happens to be, but if they keep it um, to a city and, uh a city and this is what we do. I'm an accountant in Sydney or I'm a, um, you know, advertising exec in New York, whatever it happens to be, but they forget all of those things of, yeah, how to, yeah. Um, that action, that call to, call to actions that people want, but it's got to come through in the, in the keywords as well. So I love that. Um, now, for beginners, what are the three most important things that they can work on they can start working on right now that can begin to increase their ranking. Okay, so number one, site speed. So we talked about that. Just visit that again. Go to Pingdom Site Speed. Have a look at your site. If it's taking a long time to load, think about 
getting rid of stuff, reducing images, getting rid of plugins, just making it as streamlined as possible. So that would be number one. Number two, yep. I think, would be, you know, really thinking about your audience and what they could be typing into Google to find you. Often when we write our website content, we write it from the inside out, like you just said. You know, we're very narrow-minded. I'm an accountant in Wollongong, and that's all I'm going to say about it. Thank you very much. So instead, <laughs> we, have to try and think, we have to try and think outside the box because maybe accountant Wollongong is really dominated and you're not going to win on that to start off with. So maybe you have to be a bit more suburb focused or maybe you have to start writing some content that makes people know, like and trust you or do something different to your competitors. So, yeah, thinking about your website from an outside in perspective would be probably the next thing. And then the third thing, which we haven't really touched on, but is maybe something people can go and explore on their own is building up links from other websites to your website. So Google sees that if Nikki O'Mara links to my website, it goes, well, Nikki's pretty cool and she's linking to Kate Toon. So therefore Kate Toon must be pretty cool. It's like, it's like SEO love or SEO juice flows through the link. So, Getting people to link to you is important. And you can start with easy things like yellow pages and true local and directories. But then after that, you can do things like going on podcasts and writing guest blogs. And they generate links from that site to your site. And that will help improve your ranking. So speed, content and links would be my top three. Beautiful. That is fantastic. What about internal linking as well? Is that still important to do? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's something that I think, you know, for the beginner, it kind of be quite confusing because it's like, well, I've got links in my site. What do you mean internal linking? So (laughs) instead of just having links in your navigation, what it's about is if you're on a page and you're talking about, you're an accountant and you're talking about the fact that you have a bookkeeper, that you wrap the link around the word bookkeeper and it goes to the page about bookkeeping in your site. So what you're doing is you're trying to control the journey of the user. You're not forcing them to rely on going back to the navigation or clicking on particular buttons. You're trying to drive them to content deep within your site quickly and easily through contextual links in your copy. So yeah, you know, like I had a post, for example, that did really, really well. It was like something like 10 things not to do on Facebook. Um, That post did so well and got so much traffic and ranked so well that it could help the whole site. So what I did was go through that post and add links from that very successful post to other pages within my site. And it's like the SEO juice from that post dripped down into other bits of my site and helped them improve as well. So that's internal linking in a nutshell. Yep, that's perfect. So love it there. So those three things very important. We will write them all out in um, uh, yeah, on the website as well. Now, one thing I did want to talk about. We were talking about conversion uh, writing. I do a lot of this, and I know you do as well. In terms of, I tell people you can have the most amazing looking website. Um, it can look incredible. You can have all the SEO words and you know ads to it and everything else. However, if you don't stand out as someone different that they want to work for, you know, want to work with, no matter what business or what what to buy from, um, if they can't see within the first couple of seconds that you know you want to that you are their people, then you've lost them. So have you got anything from, you know, you've got those first, say, three seconds when they first go onto your website. From an SEO point of view, is there anything else, anything that needs to be up in that, um, you know, in that first frame of your homepage? Yeah, so I agree. It's the 3.30 rule. So as you said, the three seconds for people to feel that they've come to the right site and 30 seconds to make them stay. So as you said, you need to be really careful about what's in that first panel or above the fold, Um, not some giant image, not a big slider, um, not a video that auto plays necessarily. You want to have an image that really sums up who you are and what you do. So especially if you're your own business, possibly an image of you. If you're a shop, you want to have an image that sums up your shop, not a particular individual product, but your range. And then you want to have some really great copy. So I like to, over that top image, ask a question or address a pain point. So, you know, for me, it might be, are you struggling to rank on Google? 
Or are you sick of all the terrible SEO advice out there? Who's not going to say, yes, I am. And then that encourages them to read on. And then what I think is really important to have very quickly is your USP, your unique selling proposition, which is usually just two lines of copy that say who you are, what you do, who you do it for, and why you do it better than anybody else. So that is two lines and then a call to action button. And really that's all that needs to be above the fold. If you get that USP right and you appeal to your audience and explain your point of difference, you've got them and then they'll take the next step. Yep, yep. And really at the end of the day, it takes hours to actually come up with that unique selling point, with that key message that goes up there. So, exactly. and I don't think people, I don't think people realize how long. So I, I always say, you need to spend the time. You need to understand what you're doing and spend the time to get that message right and then change it if you need to. So now yeah. look, I've got one more question for you. Favorite SEO tools for a beginner. Okay, so one of my favorites is a Chrome uh, browser bar tool. So if you've got the Chrome browser, which you should have, it's the best one. And it's called yep. SEO yep. Meta in One Click. SEO Meta in One Click. It's a great little tool. Whatever website you're on, you can click it and it will show you things like your title tag, your headers, your images, things that are wrong with your site. My number one tool would be Google Search Console. Uh, which is an amazing free tool from Google, which tells you everything that's wrong with your site and allows you to test things like speed and see what you're ranking for. Um, it's amazing. Um, and then, you know, a lot of the other tools have free trials. So, you know, I'm a big fan of SEMrush and Hrefs. Both of them have trials. I think Hrefs has seven days for seven dollars. Um, you know, they're all great. You can get in, have a play around. But again, the point is tools are great. But if you don't know what to do with the information you get from the tools, you can just feel a bit overwhelmed. So I think the most important thing is to find people like Nikki or myself who can guide you through it and be there to answer questions and try not to have too many guides and too many experts. Because one of the things about experts is they love to disagree with each other. So find somebody that you, feel <laughs> you can know, you like and trust. And just kind of focus on them and stop asking for advice from, you know, Susan in a Facebook group who, who's trying to be helpful but doesn't really understand the area. Get advice from people who know what they're talking about and that you feel have your best interests at heart. That's what I would say. I think that is perfect advice. I love it. So, now, Kate, what are you up to for, the, for this year? So we're January um, when we're recording this. So have you got anything in particular that you want to share with, share with the audience, that, uh, share with listeners? It already feels like October. I feel like it's been a long time already. <laughs> no, I mean, this year I'm keeping on, keeping on, um, launching my uh, SEO courses and I've got two memberships as well. Um, uh, and I just wrote a sales, uh, create a sales page course. So I'm just going to be promoting those. But the big thing I really want to do is this year is write my next book because um, I'm a frustrated author. So I'm going to be working on my book and hopefully my podcast. And I'll have to get you back on my podcast when it starts again, Nikki. Yeah, I'd love to. Now, on your books, I did never realise you'd written a children's book when I looked yesterday, and I love it. Yeah, so I've written a poetry book, a kid's book called Wobbly Jim, and then my first business book was called Confessions of a Misfit Entrepreneur. Um, yeah, so, yeah, the kid's book is pretty fun. Um, uh, yeah. It's, it's great. I wish my boys were uh, a bit younger. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Buy, it, buy yeah. it for you, Nikki. I'll send you a copy. <laughs> So beautiful. Thanks so much for uh, for being with me and spending the time with me today, Kate. You have uh, certainly imparted a lot of knowledge for us. Thank you so much. Uh, it's lovely talking to you. Thanks, Kate.